Hello guys and welcome back. If you are new around here, I cover mostly Australian cases and today we are covering a solved case that happened relatively recently in the grand scheme of things at least. This case is a case out of Melbourne that I feel like at least nationwide didn't get as much coverage as other similar cases out of Melbourne of young women that were just going about their daily life and alone when a male stranger attacked and killed them. Jill Maher is probably the most famous example of this and most recently we have Eurydice Dixon and Aya Mazawi. I have videos on all three of these women if you aren't familiar with their stories I'll link them down below or in that little eye above and I would be incredibly interested to know just how many of you have heard of today's case which I don't think I've even mentioned yet. This is the case of Amasa Vukicic. Anyway, just a reminder to follow me on my socials. I'm most active and honestly pretty much only active lately on Twitter. So if you want to chat, that's the place to do it. I give you updates on videos, ask you guys your thoughts and opinions and occasionally tweet useless information about my life. And I guess I must... Also touch on the current climate of our world. I don't want to dwell on it. I want my content to be a place that you don't have to think about it. So I'll just say, stay safe, stay home if possible, and we will get through this. And many of you have asked if I'm still flying. I'm a flight attendant. If you are new here, and yes, I am. So having said all that, let's get into today's solved case. So we're heading back to the year of 2015, where 17 year old Masa Vukicic lived in Melbourne, Australia in an orange and brown two story brick home in the suburb of Doncaster, which is a quiet suburban neighborhood referred to as Donny by the locals. And with a last name like Vukicic, some of you may have already guessed her nationality. Masa was actually born on December the 1st, 1997, in Montenegro, a country in southeastern Europe. And side note, I actually went down a rabbit hole looking into Montenegro as I had guessed the last name of Vukicic was somewhere from the Yugoslav region. Although Yugoslavia doesn't technically exist anymore, it's very confusing. The countries that were once part of Yugoslavia are now independent, if I understand correctly. My mum's side of the family is actually Slovenian, which is why I became curious as I didn't know much about Montenegro. Anyway, <laughs> no one cares about my thoughts. Continuing on, in the year 2000, Marsa and her family moved from Montenegro to Australia. And speaking of family, it consisted of her father, Slavaljub, her mother, Natasa, and her siblings, a brother Peter and sister Nanja. And I sincerely apologize if I have butchered any of these names. I will put them up on the screen for you. I swear I looked them up. I tried to learn how to pronounce them and I feel like I'm definitely still not getting it correct. So I do apologize. In 2015, Marsa was in her final year of high school at the Canterbury Girls Secondary College and had dreams of becoming a lawyer after graduation graduation, fantasizing about wearing beautiful designer suits and going on coffee drinking adventures with her future law colleagues. And considering how incredibly intelligent she was, Martha was well on her way to fulfilling this dream. And this somewhat sums up the kind of girl Martha was, someone that loved fashion and loved to dream. She was also hugely into cosplay or costume play, which I'm guessing came from her love of beautiful feminine fashions that stood out in a crowd. She was a lover of anything pink, pearls and royal, as you will see from her photos. And being completely serious, Martha would often say to friends and family, I'm going to be a princess one day. And that's exactly where her nickname, Princess Marcy, came from. Although her other nickname was the Princess of Selfies because, as you may have guessed, the girl loved to take a few good selfies. And looking at Amasa's photos in her costumes, I'm guessing she was heavily inspired by Lolita Fashion. I'll pop a few photos up on the screen now of Lolita Fashion, Lolita Fashion, but basically it's a super cute fashion scene 
popular in Japan, uh, at least that's what I understand it to be. Please don't come for me if I am not entirely correct. I don't know much about the history of it or much about cosplay for that matter. I'm going off photos of Master's beautiful outfits and articles I've read online. So I think you're getting a pretty good idea of what kind of girl Masa was. The word whimsical comes to mind. She almost reminds me of Alice in Wonderland. I feel like Masa is exactly the kind of person I would have loved to have been friends with. And something else Masa was passionate about was animal rights. And she even had her own little pet bunny whom she absolutely adored named Roger. And she also had a boyfriend at the time named Timothy Draper. I couldn't find any information as to how long they had been together, but I'll speak about him a little later. So we're gonna jump to March the 17th, 2015, which was a Tuesday. And as they always are, it was an ordinary day. Master went to school that day and when she came home in the afternoon, she enjoyed a meal with her family before heading out on her usual evening walk. I'm not sure of the exact time Masa left her house, judging by the timeline, I'd say after 6pm or maybe as late as 6.30 if not later. And being March in Australia, it was still light outside. And on her walk, she took her mobile phone, house keys and her headphones. Masa popped her headphones in to listen to some music as she strolled to the park that was less than half a kilometre or around 1,600 feet from her home. And the park was called the Kunung Creek Linear Reserve. And at this park, although it was pretty quiet, it was a popular spot for cyclists, joggers, and families on their evening walks. And it was also surrounded by homes and right next to a freeway. The park was considered relatively safe, although according to locals, they had had some issues with a flasher there in the past, but no major incidents had taken place there. And in fact, according again to locals, the place in the park that Masa was heading to was pretty much a place only known to the Doncaster locals. At 6.50pm, as Masa approached to the base of the footbridge in the park, Without warning, she was pushed from behind, likely not hearing the person approaching because she had her headphones on, and she was attacked. She screamed out for help, screams that surrounding neighbours could clearly hear because there were houses so close to the park, and neighbours quickly phoned police to report the terrified screams. Some witnesses also saw a man running from the park and down Hayington Avenue just after the screams were heard. And I'll get back to this man that they saw in a moment. Police soon arrived at the park where they found Martha's motionless body at the base of the park's footbridge and promptly called paramedics who arrived within minutes. But unfortunately, nothing could be done for Martha who had been stabbed a shocking total of 49 times to her upper body. As news spread through the local Doncaster community, people were in complete shock. The fact that an innocent schoolgirl had been so viciously attacked in what was usually such a quiet neighbourhood shook many to their core. When Martha's parents were informed, their sobs of pain could be heard through their neighbourhood. And at 2am, her boyfriend Tim was awoken by a knock on the door from police. They informed him that his girlfriend had been killed. Tim and Martha had been texting just before her walk. It barely seemed real to him that she was now gone. An investigation began almost immediately after Martha's body was discovered, starting with police going around the Doncaster neighbourhood, knocking door to door and looking for anyone that may have witnessed anything. Police, sniffer dogs and SES also began an extensive search of the area looking for any clues. As part of the investigation, police began trawling through CCTV footage from the area from around the time Martha was killed and it wasn't long before they uncovered footage of a mystery man running from the park and down Hangington Avenue holding a white plastic bag. 
likely the same man that some witnesses mentioned seeing after hearing Master's screams. As a weapon had not been found at or near the crime scene yet, investigators thought it was possible that the man in the CCTV footage was responsible, and the white plastic bag likely contained the weapon. So the man in the footage was thought to be in his early 20s with a slim build, medium stature and short dark hair although some early reports said he had blonde hair. He was wearing dark jeans and a dark jacket, and although his face was not clear, his overall build was, so police released the footage to the public in hopes of tracking the man down. A witness soon came forward and told police that a man that may have been the man from the CCTV footage approached him near the crime scene and asked him for directions to the Doncaster Shopping Centre. The witness described the man as being a little nervous, but also seemed pretty familiar with the area, which lined up with the investigation and the public's theory that the man had been a local. As I said earlier, where Martha was attacked in the park was a spot pretty much only known to the locals. Police believed that the attack had been random, which always makes investigations like this where there is no connection between the killer and the victim hard to solve. On the Wednesday night, the day after Martha's death, more than a hundred people gathered at the park where her life was taken to remember her, leaving her flowers, cards, letters and messages. One of these messages was from Martha's boyfriend Tim. Part of the letter read, My dear love, you will always be in my heart. I know you're up there looking down and weeping. But please, my dear, holster those tears. I will always be with you and know that to be true. I love you, my dear. I always will remember you. Love from your lover, Tim. And I'm going to touch on something quickly because it was a topic that was raised during this investigation. The same topic that has been raised in so many similar cases. Should women be walking alone? Yes, we should be able to, but is it realistically safe for us to do so? Unfortunately, in today's world, nowhere is safe in my opinion. Not just for women, but for men too. But are we in a higher risk category? Well, absolutely. I'm not saying don't go out and don't live your life, but we really do need to be vigilant no matter where we are or who we are. I hate that I even have to think about the possibility of being attacked, that I can't just walk through a park or alone at night and feel safe. But that is the reality of the world we live in. Sick people out there that target people like me. In this case, the same argument was brought up. Homicide Squad Chief Mick Hughes commented in light of Martha's attack, that parks are not safe places for women to be alone. He elaborated that women in particular need to remain vigilant. He said, quote, I suggest to people, particularly females, they shouldn't be alone in parks. I'm sorry to say that in this case. The point that Martha was wearing headphones was in particular pointed out by many. And my own thoughts on this is that man or woman wearing headphones in a place where you are more at risk is not something I would personally recommend. But at the same time, what happened to Martha was not her fault. She had every right to feel safe listening to music in a park. The Minister for Women, Fiona Richardson, said in response to McHughes that the focus should be on stopping the violence, not a victim blaming. And McHughes, in response to Fiona's response, reiterated it was not a victim blaming, but suggested that women look out for one another, walk together and take extra precautions when walking by themselves. This topic is a huge one and it's a tough topic with no one solution and no one correct answer. But let me know your thoughts down below. What do you think about all of this? By the Thursday, two days after Martha was killed, more than a hundred reports had been made to police and the investigation soon came to discover more CCTV footage possibly relating to her case. The footage showed a man in a red shirt boarding a bus on Doncaster Road 
20 minutes after Masa was attacked, the man had on black pants, running shoes, and was holding a black jacket. And just like the CCTV footage that showed a man running, this man was also carrying a white plastic bag, and pretty much wearing the same clothing except for the red shirt. The man used his Mikey card to board the bus, so police got to work tracking down the potential suspect through his card information. And a Mikey card, by the way, is a public transport swipe card or ticket that is used in Victoria. The mystery man eventually got off the bus at the corner of Hoddle and Johnson Street, but had not been seen since. Police interviewed the bus driver as well as passengers, and passengers that got off at the same stop as the man. And police also released images of this man to the public as they were incredibly clear, in hopes that someone would be able to identify him. Still on the Thursday, that morning, a series of crimes took place in Melbourne, all thought to be committed by the same person. In the suburb of Kensington, there was an attempted carjacking of an elderly man. And at 10am in Sunshine, a suburb about 15 minutes from Kensington, a 26-year-old man was attacked and robbed. And again in the same suburb, at 11.20am, a woman was sexually assaulted. By midday, practically minutes after this last attack, the man responsible for the crime spree handed himself in to the police. But he wasn't handing himself in solely for the crimes that had been committed that morning. He told police he was the one responsible for killing 17-year-old Masa Vukatic. His name was Sean Christian Price, a 31-year-old man from Albion in Melbourne's West. By Thursday afternoon, Price was charged with one count of murder, three counts of assault, two counts of robbery, and one count of rape. Police soon made a public statement telling the public they believed they had Masa's killer in custody. But the question was, who was Sean Price? And why did he so viciously attack Masa in broad daylight in what was seemingly a random attack? Masa's funeral was held at the Springvale Botanical Cemetery, where hundreds gathered to farewell the bright and bubbly teenager. Her brother and sister walked in front of her white coffin that was donned with pink roses as they carried a white cross and a framed photo of Masa. Attendees also wore pops of pink in honour of Masa's favourite colour, and when it came time to farewell Masa, attendees were asked to kiss her coffin or bow. When her coffin was lowered into the ground, dozens of pink balloons were released off into the world. And on March the 28th, over 200 friends, family and strangers gathered at the Queen Victoria Gardens to remember Masa in a march that they called Princess Marcy's Royal Parade. Her brother and sister released 17 white doves in her memory. And at the march, donations were collected for the Rabbit Runaway Orphanage in honour of Amasa's passion for animals and her beloved bunny, Roger. So let's discuss Sean Price and his extensive criminal history. Like way too many before him and so many similar cases that we've discussed here on the channel, Price had offended many, many times before he finally killed someone and should have been behind bars long before he eventually did kill. So he was born in February of 1984. His parents divorced when he was just five and Sean was raised by his mother. And his mother dated a number of different men throughout his childhood several of which were violent relationships. As a child, he was also a victim of sexual abuse, had difficulty learning and changed schools frequently. And as a result of his troubled upbringing, he went on to suffer with drug and alcohol addiction and severe mental health issues. At the age of 18 was when Price began his life of crime. When he killed Martha at the age of 31, Price was out on bail and on a 10-year supervision order. And in Jill Ma's case, just three years earlier, we saw exceptionally similar circumstances. 
Her killer, Adrian Bailey, was out on bail when he made the decision to target a random woman and kill her. Unfortunately, statistics do show that individuals on bail have a higher chance of re-offending and it seems like nothing is being done to fix it. Our system's broken and so many people are let down by it. The victims, of course, and the offenders that are never properly rehabilitated. And then there's those like Price that are such a menace to society, they simply shouldn't be allowed to roam the streets freely, ever. His criminal history from the age of 18 to 31 includes multiple sexual assaults, including one of a child, theft, stalking, threats to kill, and an extensive history of violence against women. And all of his victims were chosen at random, as Amasa had been. He told police that targeting random women gave him a buzz or a rush. Price was eventually diagnosed with schizophrenia and psychosis around 2006 and sentenced to a five and a half years in a psychiatric hospital. After this, in 2012, he was sent to Corella Place, also known as the Village of the Damned, which is a facility for Victoria's most serious sexual offenders to be sent after prison for further rehabilitation. Although his time there didn't seem to have any impact on him. And after his release from Corella Place, he went on to commit more violent acts and was sent straight back to prison for nine months. By October of 2014, Sean Price was once again a free man, but was under a supervision order until 2022. Price warned authorities upon his release that he had the urge to kill someone and by releasing him, it would be their fault. But unfortunately, they did not heed his warnings. The day before he killed Amasa, Price had a meeting with a caseworker from the Department of Corrections where they noted down that he was displaying unusual aggression and hostility before becoming abusive and cutting the meeting short. On the day Martha died, Sean Price was up and out the door by 5.30am, but seemingly with no real plan for the day. He spent 11 solid hours riding public transport around Melbourne before ending up at Crown Casino. Side note, I used to work at Crown Casino for my entire time at university, in fact. It's the worst job I've ever had in my life. Don't sue me, Crown. So as many do, believe me, Price lost every penny he had at the casino, which somehow gave him the urge to rob and stab someone, according to him. He then returned home to retrieve a knife and a spare shirt, anticipating what was ahead. When Price spotted Martha at the Doncaster Park, he told police during his interview he thought, I just fucking had to kill her. Man, I fucking had to kill her. He continued. This chick was on the other side of the road and she's coming up. Yeah, and she like started talking to a bird like fucking Snow White. I thought she's fucking, she's dressed like fucking all yuppie. Sorry, that was the most awkward quote I've ever had to quote. I'm sorry if that sounded very awkward. When Price spoke about what he did to Martha during his interview, he talked about it as if he were boasting, as if he was proud of what he had done. Sadly, Martha had just been in the wrong place at the wrong time. Price said he then ran up to her and pushed her over, and according to him, Martha begged for her life, telling him she would do anything. Price said, I just fucking started ripping and stabbing and fucking just stabbing. I went crazy. Price's crime spree continued the next day and his intention being to stab another person, telling police he was looking for somebody rich to stab and kill. Price found a victim and approached him to ask him for money. The stranger, to Price's surprise, so gave him a $50 and Price said, this generosity saved his life. He then headed to the suburb of Sunshine where he put a man in a headlock and demanded his wallet and bag. But when the man's phone fell out of his pocket, Price ended up grabbing that and running away. In the same suburb, Price attempted to steal a car when he spotted someone getting into their vehicle. 
the car owner punched Price in the face and Price fled like the coward that he is. Price then headed to a Christian bookstore where he grabbed the shop assistant, put his hands over her mouth and throat and pushed her to the ground and sexually assaulted her before fleeing when a co-worker intervened. The next day, as I discussed before, his crime spree continued before he eventually handed himself in, likely knowing he was about to be caught anyway. At the trial, Sean Price pled guilty via a video link, but shortly after pleading guilty, he started ranting about conspiracy theories, leading the magistrate to request that Price's video link be muted. His outburst continued though, saying the media was sensationalizing the case, before the video link was finally cut. Price was eventually sentenced to a life in prison with a non-parole period of 41 years. Justice Lazi described Price's prospects of rehabilitation as bleak if not non-existent and acknowledged that Price should have never have been a free man and that a broken system had let Martha Vukatic down. When Price was given the opportunity to show some sort of remorse and apologise for what he had done, he said an apology would not bring Martha back, but added, although she had suffered, it was not for long. Since his incarceration, he has been trouble, frequently attacking prison guards and is considered one of Victoria's most dangerous inmates. Just last year, the Court of Appeals reduced his sentence by a one year to 40 years because initially three years of his 41 year sentence was for breaching a supervision order relating to an assault but this was later considered double punishment. Price had to appear via video link during these proceedings and at the conclusion when he was given his sentence reduction he gave the courtroom the middle finger which perfectly sums up just the kind of disgusting person that Price is, who deserves to rot in jail for the rest of their natural born life, and quite frankly should have been in jail long before Martha was killed. And that concludes today's video. Thank you so much for listening to Martha's story. Like, comment, share, subscribe, or follow the socials. Until next time, stay vigilant, stay safe, more than ever in these in these times stay safe and i will see you next time bye guys